So I'll start the recording after we broke the universe so nobody will know. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool observation. All right, how's it going? We're in week three. Yeah, more because it's like four minutes in. One week closer to summer. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Also on the VA2. Yeah. So uh, in the number uh, we say uh, at the number at the end. So I use Q mode. Wait, say again. What do we want? So at the number at the end, I use Q mode. Oh, oh, to add to the end of the list? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so it's it's similar to what we did when we were doing the queue, right? But we're not implementing a queue, right? So don't don't put in the first, last tail head, all that sort of stuff, right? It's it's just a linked list, and you're just going to add to the end. But you can reuse most of the code that you did for the queue assignment, definitely. Sentinels are a little, I mean, they should be able to get them to work, but they're almost more effort in, in an object setting. Um, they kind of get in the way more than that. <laughs> so, you try without a Sentinel? Yeah, I, uh, I did that class to do in data and not. <coughs> okay. I made a Sentinel not. Uh, I did that uh, not. Uh, if you know, the top is not touch equal, not less equal low, okay. but set the set the set the not set the 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 they should have unlimited tries. If not, let me know and I'll fix it. But yeah, those those are are fairly low hanging fruit. So I got quiz one posted, um, and it's just some multiple choice kind of short answer conceptual stuff. Um, and I may I may go with uh, paper quizzes for some of the other ones because some of the other ones I want you to scribble out pieces of code. Um, but I don't want you to do them under intense time pressure, so I may actually make them like take-home quizzes. So kind of like homework questions, but I want you to work on them alone, basically. So, but we'll see. We got time. <clears throat> Other questions? The quiz is not uh, unlimited attempts. But... Yeah, it should, it should, oh, it's not unlimited? Mm -hmm. How many attempts does it give you? Just one. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's no fun. How can I guess all of those in one chat? Yeah, how can I possibly guess? There's so many options with quizzes, and that's a good thing, but. Multiple attempts. Shuffle answer, sure, why not? Sweet. Okay. Time limit. Not <laughs> Half cool. a minute. <laughs> not cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do take pictures every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that makes me think more. <laughs> Should I make it require an access code? All right, it should be unlimited now. <laughs> access code, I am awesome. Yeah, there you go. All right, so um, so we are going to be using IntelliJ. It might only be one L. Two Ls. So um, sometime in the next day or so, I suggest you download IntelliJ and get it up and running on your equipment. Um, it's installed on the computers in the collaboratorium also. Um, and I tried it there uh, a number of weeks ago and it seemed to work fine. So if you go to, I mean just Google IntelliJ, make sure it comes from JetBrains, go to download, 
and get the free version. Okay, so the community version is free, open source. This one's free trial, so it'll expire. Um, and just go ahead and download it and follow the usual steps. Um, so this is an integrated development environment, an IDE, that we're going to be using to do some of our, our upcoming Java development, in particular to put together things with GUIs, with graphical interfaces, buttons, and widgets, and things like that. Um, and we're going to have to use a lot of classes from a collection called Swing. And we could do that from the command line but we'd be spending a lot of our time just sort of learning the mechanics of these classes that we don't really need to know in order to use them. So we're going to let an IDE do most of the, the drudge work for us. Um, so we'll probably start talking about this maybe Wednesday. I'm not sure when we'll get there, but sometime this week we'll start playing with this. So please, please, please don't be the person who comes to me the last week of class and says I can't get IntelliJ installed or, you know, the day before an assignment's due or I don't know where to download IntelliJ from. Um, so, so download this in the next day or two and if there's any issues, let me know sooner rather than later because sometimes these things update, sometimes there's compatibility issues. I don't know how it's going to work on OS X. Um, so let's nail those down before PA3, because PA3 is going to need this. Yeah. Is it a heavy download? Say, sorry, say again. Is it a heavy download? Does it take a lot of uh, I don't think so. But it's a bit of a beast when you run it. <laughs> so we'll see. All right. Um, who hasn't signed in yet? Wow, you got it all. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, so yeah, go ahead and download that, install it, see if it works, and, and let me know if there's issues. If there's issues that seem like they're, they're not very unique to you, go ahead and post on Canvas. And let's make sure everybody's got this installed and running, or you've decided to work on the Collaboratorium machines um, in the next few days. So PA1 is great, a really good job on PA1. Um, the majority of assignments worked perfectly, which is nice. Um, and you had test code, so, so you should hopefully be able to like confirm that it works um, before you turn it in. Um, so yeah, not a whole lot to say about, about PA1. Um, and I'm going to try to come up with a grading rubric for PA2 similar to what I did for PA1 so that you know sort of exactly what you have to do to get a certain number of points. And I'm going to post that up sometime in the next few days. Um, but pretty straightforward. If all the functions worked great, you got 100% on that piece of it. Um, if there were a few things that didn't work, you lost 15 points. If there were a lot of things that didn't work, I think you lost 35. If almost nothing worked, you lost 55. And if, well, if you didn't turn it in or something, <coughs> no points. Um, documentation. So, really want to see header block in the beginning. Almost everybody had that. Um, description of each of your methods. Okay. Um, in whatever amount of detail you think would describe it. If you didn't know ahead of time what the method was doing, if you've been working on this for two weeks, you're sick to death of the reduce method, you already know what it does, so you write a comment that says, like, reduce. But if you've never seen that code before, what does that method do, right? So does it adjust the numerator denominator? Does it calculate a common factor and so on? And then lines of code, put comments on your lines of code. Right, if you're, you're reducing modulo something and setting this and checking to see if that's true and setting this equal to that and going in a while loop, there should be at least a few comments in there to say, what's going on in this chunk of 10 lines of code? Right, 10 lines of Java is a lot of stuff. So, um, so, so keep putting comments in. I saw a lot of programs with a lot of comments, which was awesome. So that was really good. It, it's definitely looking good. Um, and then just make sure you submit it correctly, fraction.class, and uh, I 
fraction.java inside pa1.tar, et cetera, et cetera. Not a whole lot of problems with that. Um, so let me let me show you a rendering of of fraction.java. Um, so this this was just my version of it. Um, So I, I commented what num and denom were just because they're the two things that are the two variables that are used throughout the class, so it's worth putting those down. And I also listed some of the detailing that I do. So the denominator is never negative. If the denominator is zero, I'm just going to treat the number as undefined. Um, and I'm going to store it as one over zero. And if there's a zero over something, I'm going to change it to zero over one. I don't even know if I need to do all those things, but I just decided I wanted to always know what the state of these things were. So. Um, so I had these conventions. <coughs> and then the constructor's pretty straightforward, right? Um, the only thing that really happens is if the denominator is negative, I make it positive by complementing both the top and the bottom. Um, I saw a lot of code that did this in two steps. If the numerator was negative and the denominator was negative, flip them both. And then it said if the numerator was positive and the denominator was negative, and it said flip them both. In which case, it doesn't really matter what the numerator is. You could combine those two and say if the denominator is negative, negate both the numerator and denominator. So you can do it in two if statements or one, that's fine. If the denominator is zero, um, I just decided to, I said in my comment it was going to be one over zero, but I seem to have saved it as zero over zero. That's okay. If the numerator is 0, that I save as 0 over 1. And then I call reduce. So reduce is a method that converts the numerator and dom denominator of the current object into simplest form. And then that's the only place I have to call it is in the constructor. Integer constructor is really easy. Just set the denominator to 1. Don't have to worry about undefined. Don't have to worry about negative denominators. Don't have to reduce. All right, so it's it's pretty easy to turn an integer into a fraction. Uh, Two-string method, again, first thing you do, see if your number is undefined. If it is, return not a number. Otherwise, return the numerator, and then either um, an empty string if the denominator is 1, or a slash followed by denominator if there's a non-1 denominator. Um, and I know the denominator is never negative, so I don't have to worry about you know 1 slash minus 3. Uh, boring accessors for numerator and denominator. I shouldn't call them boring. They're nice. Um, reduction. If the denominator is zero, it's not a number. No need to reduce it. So just return. Otherwise, I made a method called GCD. Find the GCD, divide the numerator and denominator by it. And doing it like this helps me with development because I can test this GCD function and make sure it's working. And if it's giving me back the right value, then, you know, I'm using it wrong. But chances are that's where my problem is, is in the GCD method. So now instead of trying to reduce a bunch of fractions to see if it's doing the right thing, I can just call my GCD method again and again and again with different numbers and figure out, oh, if B is negative and it's bigger than A, then it blows up or something. So GCD, if B is zero, then I'm just going to return A, because the greatest common divisor of zero and seven, if 17 and 0 would be 17. Right? A divides A, A divides 0. But that's not a case that I really care about anyway. If A is negative, I make it positive. If B is negative, I make it positive, just because I want to do this on um, positive numbers only. Got to have some ASCII art somewhere in here. So the thing that we always do in 215, where we move over the uh, the thing we're dividing by in the remainder to do the next loop, that's the crooked arrow thing. So um, there's an implementation of the crooked arrow thing. So find the remainder. If the remainder is not zero, come down and shift right. Make a the thing you were dividing by. Make b the remainder, and repeat this until the remainder is zero, and then return the last thing you divided by b, that's the GCD. And then the usual arithmetic operations, add, sub, mol, div. And these all look basically the same. First thing they do is they check to see if the denominator is 0. 
on either argument, and if it is, then we just return 1 over 0, which internally preserves the fact that the result of this operation is undefined. Otherwise, and I did a one-line version of these, but you can spell this out more, um, the second number's numerator times our denominator plus the second number's denominator times our numerator, that's the new top and the new bottom is the second number's denominator times our denominator. Make a fraction out of that. Uh, why are you using the getter on the one that's passed in for the denominator and numerator? Because denominator and numerator should be private. But they're, but you can still access them on the parameters because it knows about it inside the class. Uh, not if you mark them private. Wait. So I'm pretty sure we'll try if it. If you have, this what I did was I just used the num and denom. Mm -hmm. and I passed it, and I didn't have to use the accessor since I was already in the class, right? Well, let's see. So those are private. So like that. Huh. Interesting. I didn't realize it would give you access to that. That's a little disturbing to me. Okay. Well, that's cool. Is that a super program? It doesn't give access to the users of any other program, but within that class file, it can refer back to those private variables. But any other class cannot right. reach into those. Yeah, but I didn't know it would let you refer to them in an object other than yourself. That's interesting. Um, it shouldn't? Yeah, I didn't think so. It does, not. <coughs> does it just compile that way, or does it give you a, like a runtime error when you run that way? Well, that's a good question. I told mine. It's actually funny because I never stopped doing it. Now that I think of it, I never use the get num and get to num. <laughs> I yeah. Made, <laughs> I, made, I made those two methods, uh, but it's like, why did I never oh, use them? <laughs> yeah, that works. Oh, oh well. It's not, it's not <laughs> the first I'll thing, the it's not the first thing that raises eyebrows about Java. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely not the last. Later on, if it's, if it's a security leak somewhere, it's like, yeah, well, I, I did this in two yeah, <laughs> I was I was dredging up security leaks in Java this weekend because I was curious about stuff. It was pretty easy. Um, okay, that's cool. Well, so okay, so I use getNum just because rule follower. Um, but yeah, so you can just do f dot num. All right, so um, so add sub mol div are all basically the same, right? See if it's undefined. If it is, return an undefined. Otherwise, do whatever math you're supposed to do to perform the operation. And then divide is one extra step because if the denominator, the thing we're dividing by, um, is um, nope, it's the same thing. Never mind. Um, so yeah, if either number is undefined, then return undefined. Um, We're making a new fraction, so if we're ending up with something over zero, that will get caught in a constructor. You're right. All right, two double. Um, so two double is supposed to return a double, lowercase d. And in some cases, it works with an uppercase d, and in some cases, it doesn't. On my machine, it works fine. On the Linux server, it doesn't. <laughs> and I don't know what exactly the difference is there. Um, but the, the assignment said to make it a lowercase double, um, and that seems to work better. So to make it a double, if the denominator is zero, we return this not an n, which will get cast from an uppercase double to a lowercase double. Otherwise, we convert num to a double, divide by denom. 
Um, precision rules in Java, it uses whatever precision it needs to, um, based on the most precise element in a computation. So if I have a floating number divided by an integer, it'll treat them both as floats. If I have an int divided by an int, it'll treat them both as ints. So if you cast one of these to a double, it works. You can cast them both to a double, um, and that'll work fine also. Um, that was interesting. What did I say in the assignment? I think it was uppercase. Oh, okay. I'm misremembering that. So, um, yeah, because that'll cast to a lowercase if needed. So, so, have we already talked about this uppercase versus lowercase business on double and int? So, so usually uppercase things are classes and classes are uppercase things. So double with an uppercase D, that's the name of a class. Okay, and if you, if you look at the documentation on that, it's all of this stuff. And so it's got a bunch of methods and it's got a bunch of fields like pi and E and NAN and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a full bona fide class. But it's not a very convenient class to use if we just want to say x equals 2.5. Because we'd, we'd need to say double x equals new double parentheses 2.5. Um, and so are there, there are these primitive types which sound like the classes, but they're lowercase. So double with a lowercase d, boolean, car, um, int, float, um, and two others. Um, and they're, they're understood by the JVM to be a simplified version of this, this class. So a double with a lowercase d is just, you know, a 64-bit floating point number, basically. And you can't say, you know, variable name dot and run some of these methods or get to these fields. Um, but you can convert an uppercase double into a lowercase double. All right, um, so any questions on PA1? <coughs> so PA2, any questions on that? Yeah. When you tell us to ignore the anything that's not a letter, like the commas, the exclamation marks, do you mean by ignore as in when it prints it out, you want us to not print it out, or? That's not ignoring. So <laughs> ignoring means that you print it out and it's fine, it's there. Ignoring means they do not exist. Okay. You're reading input and here's a comma, don't even see it. Gotcha. Never do anything with it. Don't load it into memory, don't do anything with it. Okay. You can, you can take the ignore as in just ignore, it's fine. Don't do anything with it. Ah, ignore. no. <laughs> That's like saying if the building's on fire, just ignore it. <laughs> um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, so I should, I should have a clearer way of describing that. Um, in your input, if you see anything that's not a letter and not white space, throw it away. Exclude it. Exclude it, yeah. Um, all right, I can reword. I'm doing a second version of that assignment to clarify some things, so. I'll clarify that. So the, the hope is that if you see, um, hello, H-E comma L-L-O, H-E-L-L-O, um, right, if I do that as my input, it tells me I found the word hello at positions one, two, three, four, and five.
And so I ran this on War and Peace. And it took a long time, but it worked. So there's all the places where the letter uh occurs. <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's quite a few words. <laughs> there's quite a few words. So how many times does the word the occur? So I can grip for the, but it catches all the stuff with the in it. So let's grip for carrot, the, and a colon. And that should just be The word the. So how do I count how many numbers are on here? Two hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred and eighty. That's quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about that. <laughs> certain words, if they match up. Yeah. So, here's something to think about. War and Peace was um, 3.2 meg. That list I just showed you was about 4.0 meg. But this has all the information basically that War and Peace had in it originally, except for punctuation and cases. But you could reproduce the entire text from this file. Write a function that pipes that into it. And yeah, War yeah. I mean, take this and, and build up an array, and the 122nd element is A, the 142nd element is A, and so on, and just keep filling it in. The 68,381st element should be accentuating. And when you're done, you have a big array that reads out as War and Peace. So it's kind of a duel to the original text. It's slightly bigger, so it's not a good compression scheme. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why. <laughs> Except... Interesting. <laughs> and a fair amount of abusing. <laughs> Lots of accidents. <laughs> Lots of accompanying. Yeah. Oh yeah, you were here. And what is this? Accomplished work. I wonder how many times the author had to open the dictionary. <laughs> oh, I want. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's true. I need to write oh, less. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Find a different way to say uh. <laughs> and the last word is Z-WEC. Z-WEC. All right. So, um, so yeah, you can do, you can do stuff with PA2. Um, so, Important detail on PA2, and I'm also going to put this in the rewrite. Do not do the following. Do not read the entire input and try to save it in memory and then process it. Right? It makes some of the processing, it lets you think about the processing in a different way, which can be useful, but this will almost certainly blow it up. Right? And if you, if you have a billion iterations of hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye, your code should absolutely not blow up on that. It should end up with a linked list with two words, hello and goodbye, and a linked list on each one with, you know, a whole bunch of references. Um, but it should not be a problem. But if you try to read that into memory, you know, it's, it's way too much. All right, anything else on PA2? Let's talk about statics. So, let's 
Let's look at our fraction class. So as part of my fraction class, I wrote a GCD function, which lets me take two numbers and find the greatest common divisor. And it doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with a fraction. I could just pick two random numbers, and this should give me the greatest common divisor. Um, that's arguably a useful function, even if you're not doing fractions. So I'm going to go ahead and make this public. so that anybody else might be able to use this. And I'm going to try to find the GCD of two numbers in the program, and I happen to know that there's this fraction class that has this GCD method. So I want to find the GCD of 1,001 and 52. How do I do that? Well, I've got to have a fraction so that I can say, you know, name a fraction dot GCD. So I create a totally bogus fraction here, A, which is just 1 over 1, just so that I can say A dot GCD. Now A is an object of type fraction. Fraction class has a public GCD method, so this should work fine. And there's our GCD. But it's a little weird to have to create some random fraction just so that I can get to this method. So there's a mechanism to let us access a method in a class without having to create an object, just for the sake of having a way to say object name dot GCD, and that's to create what's called a static method. So if we have a static method, we can get rid of this, and instead of putting in the name of an object, we can put in the name of the class itself. And now, this is just like a function we call in C. It's part of the fraction class, and it generates the greatest common divisor. And if I do that, it'll complain and say, you're trying to call this thing as a static, but it's a non-static method. So this is the case where you would want to do the following. You'd want to declare this as a static. So like a library in C would be like a class of statics in Java? Basically, yes. Yeah. So now I can now I can compile this up and run it. Yeah, it works fine. And inside here, I could just call GCD because even though it's static, it's still a method within this class. And there's places where this is considered a syntax error, like on Stack Overflow, um, because technically you shouldn't be calling a static non-statically like this, but it'll still work. Um, but, you know, if I wanted to be really proper, I could do this. And so this is the punchline, right? We can do this kind of thing. And this is a useful thing in general, this ability to make statics. So. If we look at the Java documentation for math, math is a class. And it's got a bunch of methods like absolute value and arc cosine, et cetera, et cetera. So if we want to find the absolute value of something, instead of creating an object of type math and saying object.abs, right, abs is declared to be a static. So this is why we write things like math.abs. And it's a way to run this method by referencing the class name. So this is called a static. 
or a class method if you have something inside your your class that is not static right that's usually called an instance method it's a method that you access using an instance of that class okay so an object of that type um, so that's a static method or a class method this is an instance method and the same thing applies to fields so the math class for example we've looked at this before has um, fields like pi and e so you can say math.pi and it gives you back this fixed double which is equal to pi and that's a static variable does that make some sense so again, you probably don't need to use static for most things, but it's there as an option. So what about what about this business? Public static void main. What are the consequences of having the keyword static there? What does that allow someone to do? can I run main, the method main? This is kind of like a where does life come from question. <laughs> yeah. This allows me to say, here's the name of the class, and here's the method I want to run, and put some arguments in there. And because main is declared, little main is declared to be a static method, right? This is valid syntax. Otherwise, I would have to do something like, you know, main m equals new main, and then do little m dot main method, which is just kind of weird. So when you're at the command line, you say Java space uppercase main. You've named the class that contains your main method. The JVM starts basically running a little code which says run the static method main inside this class. And it accesses it with this type of identifier. Class name, which you gave as an argument to the Java command. And then this is always main, and this is always an array of strings. So what if we have multiple statics inside our main, and we just say Java main? Um, so I could have another public static void main, but not also with an array of strings as an argument. If I do, it'll complain when I compile that I already defined this method. It's the strings and the name main. So this is what we call the signature of a method. So the signature of main is that it's called main, and it takes an array of strings. So if we if we also do Let's just make a main method that takes takes a single string. Thanks. All right, that'll compile fine. When I try to run it, it's going to go after the method that takes an array of strings. That's still our original main method. So that's the notion of signature. If you have different signatures that the same entry could accept, like let's say you had a one, and mm -hmm. that could be an int or a string, I guess you could look at a one as a string, right? So which one would it do? Would it just do the one that it complied with? There's a rule, I don't know what it is. So... So if you had a, a public static void main int and a public static void main string, yeah. Well, what's my favorite saying in here? Let's find out. <coughs> so 
So let's um, let's try some code. The question is, if I call try with a value of 1, which one of these is it going to do, the integer or the double? I think it's going to go for the integer. And ignore that I'm writing the word static here. We'll talk about that in a second. Whoa, 17 errors from all of that. Wow. <laughs> You're missing your final curly bracket. Yeah, yeah. Well, that fixed one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Illegal start of type. It's void, so I should just call it. I'm doing something really dumb, though. I don't know what. This dot try. What? This dot try. Maybe. Are you supposed to have the brackets in the uh, public static void main next to the string? Oh, yeah. The square brackets. Oh, yeah. in public. Just <laughs> <laughs> try a keyword. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. I think it would just say that instead of puking out 16 <laughs> error messages. <laughs> So if we pass 1.3, it's definitely a double. If we pass 1, all right, that's an integer. If you swap the order, would it still say integer or would it say double first? Pretty sure it'll still be integer. Because I think it uses the lowest precision necessary or something equivalent to that. So if you add your dot, then it'll force it into a double. So that's kind of cool. All right. So since since we opened the can of worms, why do I have the keyword static here? Because if I don't, it'll say non-static method cannot be referenced from a static context. What does that mean? Um, the program main is static, right? It's being executed as, you know, main dot main or test dot main, right? So I don't have an object when I'm running this. And so if I say try it, it's kind of like this dot try it. Well, this doesn't exist, right? There is no this in this case. <laughs> Yeah. So if, if you're in a static method, right, you're running without the presence of an actual object. And so anything that looks like it's trying to refer to a field or a, a method inside an object as opposed to inside a class is going to complain. And so this looks like I'm trying to access an instance method, right, and I'm not in an instance, I'm in a static context. So that's, that's just kind of a quirky thing. And like I say, if, if you use your main method to basically create a class and start doing things in that class, then this does, doesn't come up. Okay, but if your main method starts running methods in itself, those methods are going to have to be static. But it's probably less likely to get you in trouble if you just avoid having to put in the keyword static. 
except for public static void main. But if you feel like you really need to, go for it and let me know. All right. Um, cool. So um, let's talk about class extensions tomorrow. And this will be the last piece we need before we can start playing with Swing. So try to download IntelliJ, see how that goes. Um, and I will see you tomorrow.